The Netherlands is often one of the last countries in Europe to allow new medicine on the market. Uh, so that means people who need new medicine sometimes, of course, cannot wait. That's why My Tomorrows is bringing unregistered, unaccredited drugs to the Netherlands. And um, connected to this program is researcher and doctor at Erasmus University, Eileen Bunnik. And I'd like to ask, invite Eileen Bunnik to come forward. Yeah, take a seat. So, uh, My Tomorrow's is, is basically selling uh, drugs to people for whom uh, these drugs are their final chance of survival. Uh, are there any ethical challenges connected to that? Yes, a lot. And that's also why we're doing this, uh, this research. Um, I can give you a few examples. So, first of all, we're talking about drugs that are, in the Netherlands at least, not yet uh, approved for marketing. So... Um, that means that um, the safety and the efficacy of these drugs are not yet established, at least not according to Dutch standards. So we're actually talking about giving drugs to patients um, that may be unsafe and that may be ineffective. But these, these drugs, are they registered uh, anywhere or is it also possible that these drugs are really in the first uh, phases of testing? Yes, it could be that elsewhere uh, the drug may be registered by the authorities, uh, not in the Netherlands, not yet. Or we could be talking about drugs that are actually investigational and that are still under study and not yet registered anywhere in the world. Yeah. All right, so that's, that's quite a disruptive service. Um, how do you assess the ethical aspects of such a service? Um, we started nine months ago um, and we did a little tour around the Netherlands and we spoke to, we were actually aiming to speak to maybe 15 stakeholders in the field, um, but we've n by now <laughs> have spoken to, I guess, 35 people. A lot of people take interest in this in this uh, business, um, varying from patient organizations, physicians organizations, pharmaceutical companies, health insurance organizations, um, the health inspectorate, the ministry. Um, so many uh, parties are, are looking at these developments and finding it interested, interesting. They're finding it interesting, um, but what, what I wonder um, if for such a disruptive service, except for, of course, uh, those who, uh, who, who register and accredit drugs in the Netherlands, is everyone enthusiastic about this service? Um, not everyone is as enthusiastic. Um, we talked about um, the safety. And yeah. The it's safety working. Yeah. and efficacy <laughs> problem. You could say that for, for some of these patients, um, if you're to be eligible for a named patient program, because that is what this regulation is called, that this company is making use of, named patient pro program, aflevering op artsenverklaringen in Dutch. Um, and patients are only eligible when they're very ill and when they've tried all existing standard treatment options. And um, um, you could say that for these people, they have so little to lose that some of these safety issues, most notably, um, may not be so important, but many people are concerned that about maybe the opportunity costs involved. These patients, um, uh, we've also spoken to doctors, about 15 physicians across the Netherlands, um, in semi-structured interviews, and these doctors were saying, uh, at some point these patients should maybe accept um, that there are no options left for them, and they were not totally willing to try um, to try their unapproved, unestablished options. Um, and a lot of people are concerned about the costs and about the consequences for the healthcare system at large. For instance, one of the main concerns is that patients who may uh, access investigational drugs directly may not be willing anymore to participate in clinical trials where they stand a chance of being randomized to a placebo, for instance. Um, so, so it's harder to, uh, to, to have clinical trials because people will say, well, uh, I want to have the medicine and, and not the risk of, of something that's not medicine. That is a concern that we hear a lot. Um, but in many countries, it is actually a prerequisite by law that um, patients are, cannot be enrolled in trials. So only patients are eligible for this named patient program um, to receive these drugs outside of clinical trials when they cannot participate, when they meet the exclusion criteria. Um, so this fear may not need to be justified, uh, but it is a concern. Okay. 
So um, and My Tomorrow's, of course, is a company, and uh, I would say that such a service is potentially uh, very rewarding in terms of financial gain. Um, and you're working together with just one company in, in your in your project. How do you how do you make sure that you as a researcher maintain your independence and that that your assessment has zero to do with the financial possibilities of this innovation? Yes, we get this question a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, this is a feature of the Responsible Innovation uh, Program. Um, I think that we are trained to try to assess um, uh, a service like that of My Tomorrow's in a sort of way that is as neutral as possible. Um, we've, we've been trained to be self-critical about um, some of the inclinations that we may have towards such a company. Um, we work, we clearly work at uh, Erasmus Medical Center, at our Department of Medical Ethics, um, not at the company. Um, um, I, don't, I don't experience this collaboration as a problem in the sense that um, um, I do not feel as of yet, that my assessments of this company are much influenced by this relatively small financial involvement. Um, but yes, and also we have... Um, which but is but you do get the question a lot, so people wonder, do you uh, check from time to time whether yes. you're not becoming embedded, so to speak? Then I point at the much-valued valorization panel <laughs> of the program, um, in which we've gathered um, patients, doctors, um, um, representatives of industry, uh, representatives of health insurance companies, uh, where we have a panel of very involved uh, and enthusiastic stakeholders uh, with which we regularly discuss um, the research proposal and also the sort of the more practical next steps. Um, so we keep in touch with these others who can counter sort of as a, as a balance. Okay. Now, now you mentioned uh, the example of, of how this innovation does not stand in the way of, of clinical trials or is not undermining the, um, uh, the clinical trials. Are there, are there other aspects you think that can make this, this innovation more responsible? Yes. Um, what I find interesting about this service is that it basically does three things to sort of shift existing current options for named patient programs or expanded access. Um, it tries to turn it from, from an exception into a mainstream option, a default option. That is actually sort of its mission. It wants all patients who have exhausted standard treatment options to look around and to see if there is anything anywhere in the world that is under development. So from, a, from an exception to like a ma mainstream option, then also um, named patient program was actually in ex explicitly meant to be like a therapeutic application of an investigational drug. But now we're looking into gathering information, gathering data, outcome data from these programs and that can actually be useful to sort of help the drug development and registration process. And we've noticed that especially health technology assessment agencies are very interested in this type of of data. So, so at some point clinical trials can be replaced by um, learning from practice? Well maybe not replaced but it can maybe be added. Uh, this can be complementary. That sounds nice, yeah. yeah. And it may also speed up the process because now currently um, there is a time delay between registration of a new drug and then the reimbursement decision. This often takes another year or so and you can actually make th th those two processes uh, parallel and then shorten the time it, uh, that is needed for a drug to be actually available to patients. Have you seen um, already seen one example of, of a drug really saving the life of someone which w w was not possible before? Um, yes, we have um, through the company we have uh, heard stories of patients that they've helped in the past um, but they're now uh, it must be said that um, this company is still building its service and um, the drugs that they have been um, uh, selling or providing on the market so far, they have not yet um, been registered, so they have not yet um, 
reached their final goal and they have not been widely available on the market yet. But we have seen, we, for instance, we visited uh, Turkey a couple of weeks ago to talk to physicians over there. And in Turkey, um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of patients every day are treated with drugs uh, that are off the market, that are unapproved. This is a huge difference uh, if you compare it to the Netherlands. Um, and, and these and people fare then? well. Yeah. These doctors are very satisfied with the outcomes of, uh, uh, of some of these drugs. Okay. What happens there? Yeah. Uh, a big difference because between... Because if, if everyone is faring well there... Yeah. Um, then... In the Netherlands... The that uptake, begs the question. Yeah. yeah. The uptake of investigational drugs in the Netherlands is, is extremely low if you compare it to surrounding countries. And why is that? It's probably because in Turkey, when the Ministry of Health approves uh, the use of an investigational product, there is automatic reimbursement in place. So patients will, um, will receive the drug uh, <coughs> free at the point of delivery. Um, and in the Netherlands, no such arrangements have been made. And so in Turkey, the Turkish Pharmaceutical Association handles 450 requests a day for expanded access. And in the Netherlands, it's probably about maybe a few dozens a year. So it's a, it's a huge difference. Another thing is that Turkey is a bit late to register drugs on the market. Uh, most companies go to the US first or the EU and then later on to Turkey. So Turkish doctors are in need of getting earlier access to these medications, usually. But the Netherlands is also often, often late in registering drugs, uh, as against to the US or the UK. Um, so you would say doctors in the Netherlands are in need of the same, the same steps, but... but you uh, would, and we've spoken But you think the Netherlands is never going to be uh, a Turkey with regard to, um, at least with regard to registering drugs? Um, a lot of the doctors that we've spoken to who ha have never made use of these options, uh, some of them are actually principally against it. They say this has not been proven to be effective or safe and we don't do anything that has not been proven to be effective and safe. Um, and, and do we have any doctors in the room? Or, or someone with a, a medical background, so to speak? No, we don't. Okay, that, that's safe, so you can, uh, you can continue. Um. <laughs> and, and some say, we don't know how this works, it is too much work, we, we've tried, um, but it doesn't work, and we don't know who's going to pay for this, so some just point at sort of the complexity of, of the process of trying to obtain a drug. Okay. Um, any questions with regard to uh, the company My Tomorrow's, or do you think it's, it's crystal clear what this product is about and the research? I, I wonder, is there, is there anyone else who's in a project with, which deals with just one company? Or one, or one commercial product. Yeah, there is. The gentleman in the back here. What's your name, sir? Sviester, but what was the question? Uh, <laughs> that, that's interesting, because you did raise your hand. What, what prompted you to raise your hand? Uh, you said that there's only one company involved that's paying. Yeah. As yet, I think the company itself is still looking for what it wants. So uh, it's, it's... Which company are you referring to now? It's Alliander, an energy grid uh, operator. And uh, uh, what's... What's interesting to find out is that uh, we were engaged on a common project, but as soon as we started, the project started to evolve and everything is open for negotiation and so forth. So in that sense, it's not like they have a set agenda and we have to obey that. It's, uh, the agenda is very much part of what the research is about. Yeah, so a company needs to have a set agenda before independence can be uh, an issue. <coughs> Let's say, I think it's a weakness of the, the architecture of the MVI program uh, that, we, that this, this dependence is built into the, the, the program. But um, in practice, it doesn't have to be so bad uh, as it looks on paper. Okay. Very good. You want to respond? Oh, well, I do have a very specific question. Okay, that's good for uh, Elina, if that's okay. Um, I'm, I actually have a background in medicine, I'm an ethicist, and uh, I'm actually in a project now, or used to be uh, a pan-European project with different stakeholders, also with, with uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And um, 
We were looking at the implementation of real-world evidence exactly for the point you're making about earlier reimbursement-based access, but we were looking specifically at trials, so I was wondering whether my tomorrow is thinking along these lines of why don't we put these people in trials, actually? Why are we only, why are we excluding them in the first place? Um, well, if you start from the idea that this named patient option, this expanded access option, is only open to people who cannot be enrolled in trials, um, um, the thing is that uh, in the, the sort of the drug development process as it is now, um, important information, important data about these people who are excluded from the trials is actually then missing at the moment that a drug is introduced into the market. Because after its introduction, it will be applied to a much broader patient population, including <coughs> people who are patients who are more sick, who have extra morbidities. Um, and, and, in, and sometimes um, this uh, causes the drug to be to function differently or even less in that real patient population. And, and so that is a reason to, to include, uh, apart from the sort of controlled group on which you would like to have, like the golden standard quality uh, RCT data, that uh, besides that, you would also uh, gather outcome data in a, a less homogeneous group. Uh, and, but then you'll, you'll, you'll be collecting the two types of data parallel to one another in, in, in um, a process that can, um, can also connect these two studies. So you have the clinical trial and in parallel to that you have the expanded access program where you also gather data. Um, so so the expanded access program it is, a, is a new kind of clinical trial, so to speak. Yeah. And this is also yeah. interesting from a philosophical point of view because drug uh, research and therapy had always been two distinct categories and expanded access was explicitly a therapeutic option and now it becomes um, an, an alternative way of gathering research data. Um, so this is one of the, the shifts that this company and, and, and other initiatives like it are uh, driving. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to continue to the, to the second example.